Hey everyone, Stealthy Shroud here, and today I wanted to go over all Next Fest demos I got around to playing. For those who don't know, Next Fest is a digital event hosted by Steam which showcases upcoming games along with associated demos. I'd say that this is usually an event that showcases more obscure indie titles, but obviously higher profile games do make their way in here as well. I tried to play a range of different games, but it really was whatever piqued my interest. Also, most of the demos I played for about an hour, but some I did play for quite a bit longer, and others shorter if the demo wasn't that long. Since this video will be released after Next Fest is over, some of the demos may not be available anymore. Lastly, all the links for the associated games can be found in the description below. Alright, let's get to it! The first game that I played, and the one that gave me the idea to make this video in the first place, was Millennia a 4x strategy developed by C-Prop Games and published by Paradox. If you played Civilization, then much of this game will seem familiar. Players take the role of a civilization and have to build it up through the ages by expertly balancing diplomacy, culture, economy, and of course, warfare. What I played was pretty fun. There were a lot of different systems working in tandem that will definitely take more than one playthrough to really understand, such as the many different currencies players can use for quick one-time bonuses for their budding empire. The feature that intrigued me the most was how they tackled moving into new ages. Various different things can affect how an age progresses into the next, based on the player's, or their opponent's, actions, as it's up to the first player who reaches the next age that defines it for everyone. It creates an interesting choice as to whether you try to continue researching all the tech available to you in that age, or quickly age up to gain access to the cutting edge. The combat in the game, while it admittedly does look rough, I think it might hold a lot of strategic depth. Units can wander around by themselves, but the real strategy will be in figuring out the best combinations to make an army. Archers, and later crossbowmen, are really powerful offensive units, but if they aren't protected by a strong melee unit or two, then they'll go down fast. The demo didn't delve too much into the many different combinations, but I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that in the full game. For those interested, Millennia is slated for a nebulous 2024 release date. Tales of Kenzera Zhao isn't exactly an indie title with its publisher being Electronic Arts, but Search Studios has developed a rather engaging metroidvania with a unique source material. What originally drew me to Tales of Kenzera was the inspiration for the story and setting, which is based on Bantu mythology. This obviously isn't something generally used in the media. In the game, you follow Zhao, a shaman trying to make a deal with Kalunga, the god of death, in order to bring back his father. The movement in combat was really fun. Actually, I was surprised at how much mobility the game gives you right off the bat. Usually, dashing through small tunnels and a double jump is something reserved for later, but here, it was something players could do right away. Additionally, you have two different fighting styles at your disposal with the sun and moon mass outputs on, being melee and range styles respectively. There were quite a few options in the beginning of the game, and it all responded nicely. Of course, with publisher money like EA, it's completely expected, but I still appreciated the great attention to detail with art and animations. The soundtrack was good from what I could tell, and I really liked the voice acting of the two characters, Zhao and Kulunga. For any interested, Tales of Kinzera comes out on April 24th for $19.99 USD. Next up is Monomyth, a dungeon crawler RPG developed and published by Rat Tower, who is essentially a one-man show. Monomyth is a modern take on old-school dungeon crawling. It takes more modern-style games for the movement and action, but the dungeon crawling has a lot of enemies around each corner, with switches to pull, treasures to gather, and maze-like halls. After the little tutorial area, everything felt really open and seamless. I had a lot of fun exploring around the desolate landscape. I also liked how some things were interactive, such as being able to cook the dough into bread. The combat is simple, but this was just the start of the game. I thought it was fun and akin to other action-style RPGs like Skyrim or Dark Messiah Might and Magic, which this game reminded me a lot of. I have no idea when this might come out, but I'd guess it probably still has a long while. Still worth putting on your wishlist if you like what you've seen or possibly played in the demo. In a change of pace, we have a city builder developed by Walking Tree Games and published by Starbreeze Publishing, entitled The Tribe Must Survive. This city builder has a unique setting. First, set in the Stone Age, which isn't done as much in this space, but maybe we've seen this a bit more in city builders as of recently. However, it's also mixed with Lovecraftian overtones, which is pretty cool. 
In fact, the first order of business with managing your tribe isn't making sure they have food to eat, but instead making sure they have wood to burn in order to stave off the darkness. I made the mistake of being overzealous with building in the beginning, which resulted in a couple of my tribe people being whisked away in the night. Each of the members of the tribes have their own past, stats, and relationships with one another. I'm not sure to what extent we'll see this in, because it certainly didn't feel like RimWorld, but it did seem like more complex social dynamics might be seen later in the game. One of the screens did have a cohesion section that marked the tribe's ability to work together. The game definitely seems built around how long can you last until you ultimately die, and then take what you learn into the next run. I think the early game is a bit too lax on things to do, and I found myself playing at 2x speed for a lot of it in order to gather resources faster. Eventually, you do have access to other buildings, and I think it's learning how to use these effectively, and of course, proper preparations, that will allow for longer runs. Unfortunately, my run was cut short when an eclipse occurred, a three-day one, which I definitely didn't expect. Thought it would only be a few hours in-game. Anyway, I definitely wasn't prepared with my wood or have enough beacons set up to keep them working. So... Sorry everyone in my tribe who got stolen away by some horrific cosmic entity. For any interested in this one, it releases really soon on February 22nd. The next game I tackled was Cabernet, a 2D narrative RPG developed and published by Party for Introverts. The game is set in late 19th century Eastern Europe and follows Lisa, a newly turned vampire thrown into the midst of a previously unknown supernatural high society. The demo only covered her waking up as a recent addition to the undead, and taking her first steps by learning some of her newfound abilities as well as mingling with several characters whom the player will develop bonds with throughout the story. As a vampire story, it doesn't do anything new as far as I can tell. So far, Lisa is battling between what's right and wrong, other vampires have different views on their internal existence, and how they treat humans. These are things we've seen before in vampire stories, but personally, I really enjoyed it. I also appreciated the fact that we're going back to the basics with Stoker vampires rather than the modern tellings that have taken their own creative license with them. Old school features such as giving them the ability to turn into a bat, or being unable to see one's reflection in a mirror. However, since the demo covered so little of the story, understandably so, I don't really know how the game will end up, but I did like what I played and want to keep it on my wishlist for the future. If you're interested in this as well, it's slated for a 2024 release. And if you're enjoying the video so far, then please consider leaving a like as that will help me out greatly with the YouTube algorithm gods. And let me know what demos you got around to playing. I'd love to hear what games stood out to you in the comments below. Ironwood Studios developed Pacific Drive with Kepler Interactive acting as the publisher. Pacific Drive is a driving survival game where you're traveling through the Pacific Northwest through an area that's been altered by some sort of experiment. Now the landscape is in a state of flux, and that's really all the story that has been revealed in the demo. The gameplay idea was really compelling for me. Drive around this supernatural touch Pacific Northwest landscape, and get through weird anomalies, monsters, whatever, along the way. All the while scavenging for resources to keep your car in, maybe not tip-top shape, but a drivable state. I think the game delivered on this for the most part. I really liked all the attention put into caring for the car and upgrading it as you go along. I thought the world was interesting and will be cool to see just how crazy things get in subsequent excursions. However, in a game called Pacific Drive, I think the one thing I wished was that there was more driving. I felt that I was constantly getting out of my car to get resources and parts, and I didn't really have too many instances where there was a good long stretch of road to just drive. Except in the prelude. It is the beginning of the game though, so this might change as excursions get more difficult and perhaps take longer. Either way, I'm still excited to play this game, and for anybody else interested, it comes out on February 22nd for $29.99 USD. Next is another driving game being Star Trucker, developed by Monster and & Monster and published by Raw Fury. This game is exactly as it sounds, it's a sci-fi take on a trucker simulator, which is an oddly intriguing idea for me. You play as a trucker, in space, delivering cargo to and from stations, but it's not as simple as getting from point A to point B. You need to manage your space truck systems for power, oxygen, hull integrity, etc. Your truck even has other bells and whistles like a working CB radio, the ability to turn on or off different lights, systems, and thrusters, 
and of course, a regular radio to listen to some tunes while on those long trips. Since it's a game in space, there's some Newtonian physics as would be expected, and a bit of a difficulty curve in maneuvering your space truck and yourself when needing to go out into the vacuum to patch your hull breaches. Also, don't forget that your ship is still in motion even if you hit something. So definitely don't do what I did and panic, throw on your spacesuit and step through the airlock, or you might find your ship flying off without you. Admittedly, this demo was a bit frustrating. I constantly had hull breachers, but I think it might be because I was flying through areas with a lot of debris instead of sticking to the designated highway areas. And flying itself was a challenge. However, I greatly appreciated it. Coming from recently playing Starfield a few months back, it's wholly refreshing to have all these little bells and whistles and the actual challenge of flying an immense vehicle through the expanse. Normally, I wouldn't be excited for a game about trucking, but I'm definitely interested in giving the full game a go. If you are as well, then keep an eye out for this game's release sometime this year. Abiotic Factor is a fun survival crafting game developed by Deep Field Games and published by Playstack. This one immediately drew my interest because of its fresh setting for a survival crafting game. Instead of being out in the wilderness somewhere, you're a scientist starting your job at Gate, a secret research facility studying all sorts of stuff and reminding me a lot of Black Mesa from the Half-Life series. However, as these things go, some Egghead's experience goes wrong and the whole place is in shambles, with you trying to pick up the pieces. I think the game does a really good job blending survival crafting elements with the game's storytelling, which is definitely not something done that much in this genre. Also, I found that the setting made gathering and figuring out how to make things really refreshing from a traditional survival game. I've played a lot of games in this genre, and many of them start the same way. Break some rocks, cut down some trees, make your basic axe, pick, sword, etc. Instead, I had to think a bit more as to how to gather components required for crafting recipes. Oh, I need cloth. Well, time to break apart these office chairs. Or, I need some metal. I guess busting up these cafeteria tables will do the trick. It even has a clever day-night cycle for a game that takes place in an underground facility. The power is apparently on rotation, so after 9pm, the power goes out, leaving things rather dark. And dangerous sentry bots roam the halls. This was a meaty demo. I put in 4 hours into the demo with my wife, and there still seemed like so much that we could do, and I know for a fact there were areas we didn't even explore. Judging from the trailer, it seems like there'll be so much more. We're really excited to play more of this, and everyone can play on the release date, which is May 3rd. Digging into the more obscure parts of Nexfest is Adaptory, a space colony builder developed and published by Stormcloak Games. I originally heard about it because Stormcloak Games is actually a friend of Studio Hipsword, the game studio I help out to make the Siege of Giamdu. Shameless plug, check the link in the description to learn more about our game. The Adaptory demo has you building a variety of machines to provide power and oxygen for your stranded crew. All the while, you're searching for a special ore needed to power your transmitter and send a signal out for rescue. It's a simple enough demo after a couple of failed runs, but it shows a strong foundation for the game. It sets itself up nicely for added features in the future to add to the complexity and bring new things for players to do, which they have several planned on their roadmap. One thing that really intrigued me was the game's focus on building out the pawn's story as it unfolds. Adaptory does this through the use of conversations that they have where you can actually see what they're saying, and diary entries they write talking about events that happened to them. This is something that I think isn't explored that much in this genre, and I think it sets Adaptory apart from the rest. I love the Sims feel these kinds of games have, but it's usually up to the player's imagination, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes I do wonder exactly what was said or what they're thinking. So Adaptory has a nice change of pace to this. For any interested, you can expect to play this sometime later this year. Last but not least, I played Mortal Glory 2, which is developed and published by Red Beak Games, and actually is a solo dev by the name of Aro, who is someone I follow in the indie game dev YouTube space. It's a tactical turn-based roguelite game where the player controls a group of gladiators and takes them through different arenas to become champions. Along the way, they'll gain new weapons, armor, equipment, and skills. Also, each character has their own racial-specific skill. With a ton of different races in the roster, many different skills, and equipment, it can lead to a wide array of different playstyles. Combat is quick and snappy, but you really have to think about each of your moves based on the environmental hazards, skills the enemy has, and arena objects littered throughout. 
It mentions the game's excellent AI on the store page, and, from what I can tell, they really are smart. The enemies seem to try to gauge their movement based on the effective range of my spells, or line up attacks that utilize the arena's environment. I like what I played, and I think it will be great for aficionados of tactical turn-based strategy. For any interested, you could expect to pick up the game on March 5th. And that wraps up my thoughts on the demos played this Steam Next Fest. Actually, this was the first Next Fest I bothered with playing anything, and I had a lot of fun. It was great to explore titles I've been looking forward to, finding new games I hadn't heard of, and being able to spotlight games that I feel could use some extra attention. Are there any games I talked about that you're also excited for? I hope this video helped you in some small way, and if it did, then please consider leaving a like, comment, subscribe, or whatever it is you feel like doing. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.